Psalm chapter number 91. Verse number 9 is where we're going to start our reading today. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation, there shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and the adder, the young lion, and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. Because he hath set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high, because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Now, from verse 9 down to verse number 13, that's the psalmist talking. From verse 14 down to the end, that's God talking in context. So verse number 9, the psalmist says, Because thou hast made the Lord which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation. Verses 1 through 8, the psalmist just gets to testify a little bit about everything that God's done for him. And then, verse number 9, he says, Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, thy habitation. Okay, now I'll call back to verse number 1. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High. Okay, verse number 9 hath made the Lord thy habitation. Right? Dwell and habitation are permanent. Right? Didn't say a hotel, habitation. Okay, that means that that's where you not just go for, you know, for a time of refuge. Doesn't mean that that's just where you go when trouble shows up so that he can be your fortress. No, he's your refuge. He's your fortress. He's your high tower because that's where you are all the time. Okay, I've made the analogy before... You know, back in old, old times over in England, right? When there was a feudal system, there were serfs, there were knights, there were kings, there were lords, right? They had great big towns where everybody lived, but the farmers left to go labor in the day, but they always came back to the town at night because the town had the walls. The town had the guards. The town had safety, security, protection, right? If somebody tried to come and take your stuff, if you were outside the walls, it'd be pretty easy. But a band of, you know, rap, or not band of rap, a band of bandits is what I was trying to say, shows up. If they've got weapons and you don't, well, it's pretty easy to take you out. But if you're inside the walls, weapons won't take down walls. Right? right? Even if a whole army shows up, if the walls are good enough, if your fortifications are good, if you've got enough supplies, the army outside's never going to get on the inside. Well, see, I'm not relying on fortifications. I'm not relying on supplies. The psalmist is saying, I trust in the one that made it all, that can provide it all. Amen. I mean, we don't have time to get into everything they say. He said, you'll be my shield and my buckler. Right? I shall not fear the arrow that flies by daytime. Right? He said, it doesn't matter what it is. God's got it. Amen. Then he says, because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, right, even the most high, that's capitalized because there's only one high. It's thrones on the sides of the north. Can't get higher than he is. Right? Thy habitation. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. You want to know why I'm not worried about Rona? Right there. You want to know why it hasn't bothered me? Right there. You want to know why when I picked Sydney up from the airport yesterday and we went to go walk into Walgreens, she said, it says that masks are mandatory. I said, watch me. Nobody said anything. Right? Didn't have one on. Right? Why is that? I don't know. I've just learned that if I like walk like I'm, I've got something to do, people just get out of my way. I've, just, I've learned that. But you know why I'm not worried about it? Because God's my refuge. Right? No plague, no pestilence is a problem for God. The only time it's a problem for me is if I get away from him. Right? Well, notice it also didn't say affliction. It didn't say temptation. It didn't say sickness. It said plagues. You know what happens when you get sick? You get better. You know what happens when you're plagued? You die. Right? You want to know what a plague is? Sin is a plague. There's no escaping it. Right, Because I've made in my habitation, the only way I was able to do that is because first he cleansed me. He got rid of the plague that one was going to kill me physically, 
But since then, a lot of plagues, not just physical ones, right? Like bubonic plague, I think one-third of the people on the earth died. That's a plague. Right? Flu, not a plague. Okay, it may, you know, if somebody's been sick before, if they're predisposed to upper respiratory infections, it may harm them, but not a plague. Right? SARS, you remember when SARS, it, everybody in Asia was wearing masks back then? I never really. It's the only thing about it around here. I mean, I remember at the time we was traveling, Brother Bobby Cato's uh, uh, camp meeting down there. Nobody wearing masks then. Right? Why aren't people worried most of the time if they got God? Because God's got it. Amen. You know why America used to not worry about things? Because they had God. You know why they didn't care about watching the, the skies trying to figure out when it's going to rain? Because they just prayed, and when God said plant, they planted. Then they would pray that God would send rain and would give them a harvest. Those that knew God had a better harvest in those times when it was dry than those that didn't. Right? I mean, I've read about revivals in America where, you know, Dad's mentioned this before where the coal miners would get saved and they'd say even the donkeys knew that they got saved because they treated the donkeys better. Right? Say, but you just can tell something's different in their life. It's not what they did. It's not how they do it. It's just because they believe God. Right? Don't have to worry about plagues coming to my door. I mean, we can go and look at, you know, Pharaoh, Moses, all the plagues that were sent to Egypt. When God killed all the cows of the Egyptians, not one of the cows of the Israelites died. Right? The plague came to where they were, but it didn't make it to their house. Right? You may have to deal with it, but it'll never conquer you. It'll never get inside of your house unless you leave the master's house. Right? Then verse number 10. I mean verse number 11. For he shall give his angels charge over thee. That's plural. I've heard for years that God gives each one of us a guardian angel, singular. There are some days I know it takes more than one to keep me out of trouble. Okay, but that is plural. Right, because God cares for us so much, even though He runs everything, right, even though I'm in His hand, His hand's in the Father's hand, no man can pluck me out of the Father's hand, just because He loves me so much, he put in there a verse, I'm even going to give you like secret service detail. He says, I got it. But if I choose to send an angel by your way as a messenger, that's what angel means, messenger of God. If I send a, you know, choose to send a messenger by your way to deliver a bit of news, right? he could have showed up, stepped up. But why does he use messengers sometimes? Because the just shall live by faith. When it doesn't make sense, and when everything in our carnal man is saying, yeah, I, I think we should do something, but if the message was, God said, stay still. Faith will cause us to stay still. Right? He gives messengers charge. I mean, what did John the Revelator call the pastor of the churches in Revelation? Angels. The letter that was written to the angel of the church of Laodicea. Right? Why did it? Because it was a messenger. You know what the under shepherd is charged with? Watching the flock of God. Not just talking about celestial beings here, although certainly I'm glad that on them days where I plead the blood because I can't deal with whatever the world's thrown at me, God may send an angel like he did with Daniel to interfere in the matter. But other times God speaks through people. One of them, the angel of the church, as John, as John wrote, would be our pastor. Amen. Why are they given charge over us? Right? To keep thee in all thy ways, they shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against the stone. Right? Now certainly, we can take this passage and apply it to the Lord, Jesus Christ. It's what Satan tempted him with. Right? Call, throw yourself off. Call the angels to hoist you up that you don't fall off well we're not going to get into whole, you know, that situation but sometimes those messengers being people right? why do you think the writer of Hebrews said 
you know, to entertain strangers because you may entertain angels unaware? Not always. I mean, I believe. Sometimes you could have entertained a slip. But other times, it's just somebody God sent by your way with a word fitly spoken. You think it's just somebody else walking around, but God sent them to be a messenger unto you. But what do they do? Well, if it's people in the church, what's our command? That we love one another. That's how the world will know he's decided. But that we bear one another's burdens. God has fitly framed us together that we can hoist each other, bear them up in our hands, just like Aaron and her lifted the hands of the man of God, Moses, on the mountain. Because as long as his hands were in the air, the Israelites prevailed in battle. His arms got tired, so they bore up his burden for him. Set him down on a rock. Why? Because his legs were starting to get a little weak. You know, spiritually speaking, he may have stumbled over a stone, so they sat him down and lifted him up with their hands. Sometimes in your life, there are times that it's all you can do to just keep moving. And your feet start dragging, and the devil's got a snare out there that if you trip over it, the whole load's going to spill out. All your effort would have been for naught, but God will just send a messenger by. He'll just send somebody by to help hoist you up. And then sometimes God may show up himself, bear you up in his arms, because he said, take my yoke upon you. You know he takes every step with you. He's already took it before you ever look up the load, because he's, you know, yesterday, today, forever, he's already there. He's already done it. He's seen the end. That's good enough. But every now and then, the spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. We need to be bore up. But the psalmist is saying, because you've made God your habitation, He will do that. He'll see to it that when you're at your weakest, when, unbeknownst to you, there's a stone out there that's a stumbling block for you, God may just give the pastor a message. God may just have somebody send you a card. Somebody may send you a text just saying, hey, I'm praying for you. Hey, I love you. What is that? That's just a messenger from God to maybe steer us off course. Just to adjust the way that we're going just a little bit because he doesn't want us to dash our foot against the stone. You know what happens if you dash your foot up against the stone hard enough? I mean, I hit. I can't remember when it was. Oh, I was getting ready for church one Sunday. That's what it was. Stubbed my toe on the end of the bed, but split a toenail in half. That didn't feel good. I didn't hit it that hard, but that still was painful. I was walking different for a little bit. But if you hit it hard enough, you'll shatter every bone in your foot. If you do that, you're not going anywhere for a while. And when you're injured, when you're on the side of the road, wondering, well, how in the world am I going to deal with this? That's when the devil can creep up. That's when you're most vulnerable because you've stopped moving. You're away from the city because you were out doing something for the master. And now night starts falling and you're all alone outside the walls. But because God cares for it, he sends messengers that even if you've stubbed your toe, even if you've shattered every, he may send a messenger by to bear you and your burden back to the city walls so that you're safe. Then, verse number 13, thou shalt tread upon the lion and the adder. The adder, one of them things that I hate, that's a snake. But it's a venomous snake, native to the Middle East. They, I mean, there's a whole bunch of different... There's one called the Death Adder. Don't, want, don't need to go near it. Don't need to see it. Didn't even want to know about it, but I learned about that one. But you know why they called it the Death Adder? Because it'll kill you. Right? But, spiritually speaking, you know what a lion is? That's something that's going to kill you quick. A lion, when it hunts, its whole goal is to get the animal slowed down enough that it can get its jaws around its neck and then it cuts off the air supply. Keeps you from breathing. Well, what's our spiritual breath? The Holy Ghost. Right? If you stop listening to the Holy Ghost, you're going to die real quick spiritually. You know what the adder is? That's something that will kill you slowly. You may get bit. It may be an hour. It may be a day. It may be a week. But why were the barbarians surprised when that adder came out of the fire when the apostle Paul put some sticks on it because he got bit and he didn't die they say he got bit he's going to die doesn't matter when it's just it's a done deal he's a dead man 
You know, as the old westerns would say, dead man walking. Right, he's already dead, he just don't know it yet. But yet, they kept watching him, and he didn't die. Right here, it doesn't say you're going to survive the bite, you're going to tread it underfoot. I mean, first prophecy that Jesus was going to come is that you'd bruise his heel, but Jesus would bruise the devil's head. Well, because he's already been conquered, he never had any power that God didn't give him. But if the devil parks outside your front door, if God says you can't do nothing to him, you'll walk all over him all day long. But what is that venom that'll kill you? Bitterness, envy, apathy, complacency. I can't remember if I taught it in here or I taught it in teens class, but I taught a lesson one time on snake bit. There's a whole bunch of different snakes that can kill you a whole bunch of different ways. But each one of them has one thing in common. Once you're bit, it's too late. But I know the one that has the ball of Gilead. I know the one that can heal all wounds. Just because it's taking it, you know, nowadays they got that antivenom, depending on which snake. Some snakes, they bite you, you're dead in like 10 minutes. Right? I don't know which ones those are, but I know that we don't have any of them here, so, hey, I'm good. All right? I think they're all down in Australia, and I'm never going there. Right, they also got spiders about this big, and I'm not really that afraid of spiders, but when it's that big, I'm good. I'm good. Right? I'm not going to walk up and start poking things with sticks. When I became a man, put away childish things. Right? But some snakes, you get bit, they've got time to get you to the hospital. They've got time to get the antivenom. Sometimes they don't even have it at that, that hospital. They've got to fly it in from another one. But as long as they get it to you in time, yeah, you may have some side effects. It, it did some damage, but your body will heal it over time. Right? You get bit by the adder, by Satan, or maybe Satan using one of those people that you know we've heard preached about, those weak-minded Christians that aren't rooted in the faith. A person may even bite you as a snake, and it may do damage. But there's one that can heal it all. may not be taken away immediately. Not a miracle cure, but he can nullify that toxin, and then he can start working on those areas that were damaged. But there's no sense in trying to fix what's going wrong if the cause is still in the body. That's why we're written that he pluck up the root of bitterness. Not the fruit of the root of bitterness, but the root of bitterness. Why? Because as long as the root's still there, it haven't solved the problem. Yes, All the work you're putting into trying to fix this is just going to be undone. Why do you think God moves towards us when we move towards him? Because that's repentance. We turn from it. We've killed the root. And then he can start working on the problem. But as long as we keep that, we can hold on to that bitterness, that envy, the strife, right, complacency. We can hold on to that venom all day long. But until we let go of it, God can't really help us. Because everything that he would do for us is going to be undone. And God does not waste his mercies, his grace. Long-suffering never, you know, until the day that he calls the church out of here, even then his long-suffering is not gone. Because those that have never heard the gospel can find it. I mean, Brother Brian, I'm not taking this with me when he raptures me out of here. People are going to find this. They're going to read it. Some are going to believe it. And then the Bible says a number that cannot be numbered is going to come out. Right? Well, even then, is it long-suffering? But there is a day at the lake of fire, it will run out. Right? But as a child of God, there's a time that he'll suffer with me. But then there's a time when it runs out. Look at the second half of this verse. He says, The young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. Now he's not just talking about a lion, talking about a adder. No, 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 no. The young lion, you know who that is? The one trying to make a name for himself. The young lion's the one that's going out there and trying to take over the pride. He'll challenge the one that's been in control. Sound familiar? 
Remind you of anybody? Because there's a lion that Peter wrote about, walking about seeking whom he may devour. You know why he's the young lion? Because there's another lion, the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's been challenging him for years, and he still can't overcome him, never will overcome him. But then one day we'll see him as he is, as that great serpent, that dragon, he's going to be cast off into the lake of fire. But it doesn't matter how big or how small the lion is. doesn't matter how nasty the snake is. You can tread it underfoot if, you, with the, if you've made the Lord your habitation. Right then, verse number 14, Because he hath set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. We find deliverance. Then we find an appointment. I will set him on high. You know, that means he's going to give you a position. He'll give you something to do for him that he hasn't entrusted to anybody else. Why would God save you personally unless he had something personally for you to do? But then, because he hath known my name, he shall call upon me and I will answer him. What's that? That's communication. That's that fellowship that God desired to have with man in the garden and he had with Adam and Eve until he sinned. That's that fellowship restored that God desired for you to know him because he has known my name and he knew you. He knew us before we ever knew him. But he desires not to know of him, to know him and the power of his resurrection to know not just about him to know who he is you know why so many people throughout the Bible have so many different names for God because they've known him and to them God meant something different than it was because he's a personal God they knew him differently then you will know it, but you'll know him just the way that you need to know him. Amen. There are some things that are universal. We all should know him as Lord and Savior. Right? But there were days when David knew him as the one that he sang praises about. There were days that David knew him as the one that restored everything that was taken from him at Ziklag. There were days that the Lord came by and comforted him after he had lost a son that tried to overthrow him and take the kingdom. And God was closer to him than even his best... Jonathan. He lost Jonathan, his best friend. The one that God had knit their hearts together. But yet God stepped in and filled those roles each and every time. Why do you think David was a man after God's heart? Because he wanted to know as much as he could about God. He wasn't satisfied with knowing about him and what other people would tell him. He said, no, 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 I want to find out for myself. But then... Not only will I answer him, I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. It'd been enough if he just delivered us. But on top of it, he says, I'm going to establish him. What does honor mean? It means to bring recognition to. to. Well, what have I done worth anything? Nothing. But I'm robed in the righteousness of his son. And he honors his son. Some people say, well, how come this? I don't know. Why did God do that for you? I don't know, but I'm thankful. Amen. I just know that those that are faithful, He does reward. He establishes them. He makes a name known for them. Is it always known far and wide? No, but it's known to those that need to know about Him. He honors you so that the world will see something different so that they will then honor His Son. Yes. Not about me. It's just about pointing them in the right direction. Amen. But then, life's verse, with long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Now see, we could get on satisfaction, taste and see that the Lord is good. But if you've tasted, you already know how he can satisfy. And we don't have enough time to get to everything. But in the latter, he said, I will show him my salvation. He already gave his salvation. It's another thing for him to show you what that salvation really is. If you really knew all that you got a hold of when God saved you everything that he did for you can't really explain all of it because half of it's never been told it's waiting on us in heaven 
I do know that one day I'm going to get to sit in his throne with him. I don't even know what it looks like. John did his best, but he's limited to things that I knew about in order to describe what it looked like. I don't even really know what he looks like. I, I got an image up, but even that, not going to do it justice. And I'm not going to try and figure it out because God said not to create any graven image, anything in heaven and earth, under the earth. I don't want to get it wrong and get there and then God said you was guilty of thinking that you knew what I looked like. That's it. I just know he's going to look great, amazing, wonderful, beautiful. Right? It's going to be good. But when he shows us what that salvation really is, what's that? That's where you live in the king's city and the king starts going around and showing you how everything works and how what you do really does make a difference for somebody else. How your commitment, he may just give you a glimpse here, a glimpse there. Somebody coming up and giving you a card out of the blue. Somebody coming up, just sending you a text message. Hey, love you, appreciate you. But where he shows you that our labor's not in vain. It's very easy to think, well, this salvation was a burden. Because it feels like I'm giving and giving and giving, and I don't see the fruit of it. And you look around and the fields are white under harvest. And you're looking in your load and there's very little fruit. Jeremiah had that... I mean, he's pre nobody repenting. He's preaching as hard as he can. He tries to give up. He says, I'm not going to do it no more. If they're not going to... He's not saying that God hadn't you know, followed through on what he said. He said, what's the point in telling them what God says if they don't even want to listen? He's upset with people, not with God. But then his focus got shifted again. God showed him the salvation of God. And Jeremiah said, well, he gave me a love for him. And his words burning in my very bones. I mean, he loved him so much that he wrote a whole book of the Bible on how heartbroken he was to see that God's people didn't repent. He said, doesn't matter if they hear me, God's still worthy to go and tell them. When he shows you that, maybe he got down there, he started showing Jeremiah, one of these days there's going to be a pastor in Florence, Kentucky named Doug Foster. Jeremiah is going to be one of his favorite books of the Bible. Well, it is his favorite book. Jeremiah chapter number 33, verse number 3. Right? It used to be, when, used to be what it was open to down there. I don't know when may have blown one of the pages. Right? He says that book's going to have an impact on him, then he's going to have an impact on a church. All because of your faithfulness. I don't know. But every now and then he just comes and shows that your new life does mean something. That new creature that he made is accomplishing something. As long as we continue to labor for him. He may show you the benefits. He may show you the fruit. But eventually one of these days he's going to show you the finished product of what our salvation is. What's that? Well, it, in the Father's house, there are many mansions. Yes. Hey. Right. If it were not so, Jesus would have told us. But then, He's already gone to prepare a place so that where He is, I can be there too. Amen. Not for a time. He didn't say that I go to prepare a place for a moment, for a season. Right now, He says, you're just living with us from now on. For all eternity. And He gave me a mansion even though I mean, let's be honest. There's only one day. I'll never need to sleep. Right? We're, I find we're going to spend a lot of time around the throne. I'm never even going to use it, but because He loved me, He says, I'm just going to give you a place anyway. Yeah. We may never use it, Brother Brian. But he, because He loved us, because He's a you know, gracious host, He says, I'm going to make sure that each one of them got a place that's theirs inside of my house. But what I really want to talk about for a few more minutes, verse number 14. Why would God do all of this? I know it's because, you know, I know it's not because we're worthy. I know it's not because we're anything special. I know it's not that God is incapable of doing what He asks us to do. God could do it all without us, so why does God, one, choose to use us? Why does God choose to 
shower us with blessings that when the adder comes to our door he steps in front of us and says not today I got this just keep doing what I should do I'll take care of this right, why is it when they come to the city gates and the devil's got a list of things that I've done and they say hey throw him out and we'll leave you all alone we just want him but right, surely Lord he's failed you enough that you'll throw him out of the city and God says well what do you say son and then the son looks at the father and says yeah he's engraved in the palms of my hand and then the father says nope can't have him why is that well it's because of something that we all can do he says because he hath set his love upon me therefore will I deliver him because he set his love upon me now as I'm reading that brother Aaron I'm thinking about when they set gemstones in the rings when they set something precious in something else that's precious you don't put it there for a time you fix it there you make sure that it ain't gonna go nowhere why because it's very precious not just to you but to the recipient Right, you, I don't know Christian not here for me to pick on him Christian could have gone out and just gotten a rock and handed it to Taya and said hey you want to get married he could have gotten you know a nice rock a gem and gone to her and said here I got you this but what good is something that's loose right that's something that you can take back that's something that the other can lose hold of Right? Even though it's cherished, and I'm not saying that God would lose our faith, but keep in mind, we were so enthralled with God that we said, even though He doesn't lose anything, I want to make sure that it ain't going nowhere. I want to set it to where it's never going to be moved. If God set you upon the rock when we got saved, that means you ain't going nowhere. So if we set our love upon God, that means it's not going nowhere. But see, not only does it mean to fix, to place it somewhere, but it also means that you got rid of it. If I set it somewhere, when I leave, it stays there. I don't take my love with me wherever I go. It's permanently with God. Why do you think Jesus said that where your heart is, there your treasure shall be also? Right? Because you're going to keep coming back to it and the one that you love wherever your heart is that's where you're going to put your best Jesus wasn't saying you're going to air mail your treasure to your no 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 you keep going back to the thing that you love and when you're there you give your best because you love right now you can't set something if you hold part of it back because that means one of two things God's got a place for each one of us. He says, if you'll set your love here, it ain't going nowhere. I'll keep it. Right? Because even the reed that they gave Jesus when they were beating him in the hall of praetorium, that was a piece of dead grass, but yet they took it back. Because anything committed unto Christ, he always keeps it. Just the way that it was given to him. In fact, most of the time he gave it back better. But when you entrust it to him, it's saying, I have faith that you're not going to abuse this love. You're not going to manipulate this love. You're not going to use this for your own gain. Because I've known people that have done that. I've had that happen to me. And you know what I learned? If I give him all my love, can't nobody touch it. But if you take part of it, that means that love doesn't quite fit in that setting. It means that God really can't fix it to where it stays there. Because there's something missing. It's like a Lego kit that's missing, you know, the most important piece. Right? For God so loved the world that He gave all His Son Himself when you start looking at it. Right? What did He give? All. Why? So that all could be saved. He doesn't ask for all that we have. He just asks for all our love. And when we go through with it what does that symbolize to God 
That means that we are saying, I'm claiming my residence in that land I've never been to. I'm embracing the fact that I'm a pilgrim and stranger in this world. There's nothing here left for me anymore. Everything that I need, everything I desire, everything that I could ever hope for is with Him. So that's where I'll put my affection. But that's also where I'm putting my sight on. The thing that you love is going to get your attention. Not voluntary. You're just going to pay attention to the thing that you love. Right? If it's that important to you that you've given all your heart to it, you're going to do more than just check in every now and then. Right? As the psalmist said, because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, thy habitation. If you set your love on God, you're moving in with God. That's where you live now. That's where you'll be. You'll care about what the Lord approves or disapproves of what you're getting ready to do. You'll stop and ask. When in a quandary, you're going to go back and say, Lord, what should I do? And then if there isn't an answer, instead of just trying to figure it out yourself, you'll wait on an answer. I have learned that when God says do it, do it. And when God says don't, don't. When God speaks, listen. When He doesn't, wait. Because the answer is coming. But as our pastor would say, when there's doubt, don't. But when you fix, when you set your love upon God, you're saying, all I am belongs to you. You mean so much to me that I care about whether each step that I take is in the footprint of Christ. When you set your love upon something, that person's opinion means more than anybody else's. When you set your love, you're not just going to be looking back to... You're going to be, as the Lord says, you know, I stand at the door and knock. All you have to do is open. I will come in and sup with Him. And we've heard our pastor teach that that's where they would take the saucer and pour the drink out from it. And then they both, from each side of the plate, would drink from it. It was a sign of their intimacy, their closeness. God's saying, I want to come in and get closer than you than you ever thought that you could get to God. And while I'm there, just pour out something in the saucer for us both to partake of. It's going to be good. But when you set your that's what you desire every day we find that you know Esther when she was made queen any time that she said hey honey I got some business he'd let her into the court with the other men that was very uncommon back in that day the queen even though she was queen she had her own estate she had the crown she was the queen but when the men were doing business, the queen usually wasn't permitted to be there. But all she had to do was walk in and look at the king and say, Hey, honey. And he'd reach out that golden scepter. He's saying, My love for her is so strong, regardless of who's around, regardless of what they want to talk about, she's the one that's most important. When we have that attitude towards God, God says, You can come see me whenever you want to. And Esther, each time that she did that, she knew that if the king wasn't happy with her that day, he could have her killed under the law. I don't have to worry about that. In fact, God says He made me a priest that I can boldly enter into the throne room of God. He wants me to draw nigh to the very throne of God. But if my love isn't set upon Him, I don't desire to go to the throne room of God. Because something else means more to me. That's what drags my attention. That's what drives my motivations. Doesn't have to be something wicked. But if it ain't God, it's iniquity. And what is iniquity? Separation. Something enmity between you and God where God cannot be what God desires to be for you. Because you have allowed something to come in the way and you have to remove it before God can restore the relationship. Because if I take part of my love back with me, what is that part that I'm taking with me? The part that means the most to me. That little boy 
you know, after his, Jesus gets done teaching the thousands, he didn't say, all right, Lord, I got five loaves and two fishes. You can have one fish and two loaves. He just said, Lord, here. The Lord could have done it with one fish and two loaves. He's God. He made tax money come out of a fish. Right? Making more fish wasn't a problem. He put money in a fish. Right? But that little boy, after hearing him teach, he just said he can have whatever he wants. Because all I want is him. And everybody talks about that boy went away with 12 baskets. That boy went away knowing Jesus. That's all he cared about. He didn't care about those baskets. He didn't come in and say, Mom, look at what we got to eat. He said, Mom, wait until I tell you about the one I met today. He didn't care about the food. He cared about the one that gave it to him. His love wasn't fixed on the fish and on the bread. And although I'm sure they ate well for a while, and every time that they ate it, they gave thanks and praise unto God. He wasn't focused on the baskets. He was focused on the one that... And by the way, where did they get the baskets? I know I've mentioned that before. Jesus could have said, hey, baskets. And they could have just come... The ground could have grown up and made them themselves and then cut off. Right? I get that. He made all the plants grow in one day when he made it all. He can do whatever he wants to. But the boy wasn't saying, you're not going to believe what I saw today. You're not going to believe what... you know." happened to me today you're not going to believe who I met today was what he came home and told his mom mom let me tell you about the one that changed everything in my life and then just so that you believe me he gave me these 12 baskets to show you that something happened because I didn't go out and catch all these fish I didn't bake all this bread so you know something had to happen because he didn't care about the baskets didn't care about the food didn't care about the bread He'd have left it all at the hillside if the Lord didn't give it to him. The Lord, I could see him like the madman of Gadaret. Lord, I don't need this food. There's probably still people out there that are hungry. He's saying, look at them. They're all in the food coma. Take it home. It says they ate until they were filled. They were satisfied. And the little boy says, all right, Lord, if you tell me to take it, I'll take it. He says, take it. Go. I could see him say, Lord, you've done enough for me. I don't need all that food. Say, Lord, I, give it to somebody else that needs it. He says, take it home and show your mama what happened here today. And he's saying, all right, I'll take it, but I'm going to tell her about you first. What that madman do? He went into town, and the next time Jesus came by, everybody in town came out to greet him because they were saying, we thought you was a demon, but come to find out, you're the one that has power over everything. Uh, you're God. So uh, this crazy guy has been preaching to us for a while, and we would like to know you. Why? Because one person sets their affection on God. Other people see the sincerity of that love and they say there's something special about God. How was David able? So many times. You look at David's life and you think, I don't know if I'd be able to handle that. How'd he overcome that? How'd he deal with that? You know why David was so heartbroken after he sinned? Because he didn't hear anything from God. Then when he found out that it was his choice that caused him to lose fellowship with God, he got it made right. Because his love was... He didn't realize that he had taken some of his love. The man of God came by and sent an angel. The angel lifted him up a little bit and said, Hey, you stubbed your toe because you took some of your love back. You lusted. And then now you're guilty of killing Uriah, the Hittite. Right? And you took his wife because you coveted. You lusted after his wife. Then David says, All right, let's get it all made right. Not... Months down the line after being miserable, he says, now, I need to get this made right because I need to give, all, give my love, need to set all of my love back on God. He was so serious about it that he didn't stop and say, well, what's it, what's it going to cost me? What do I have to give up? He didn't have to give anything. He just had to give himself back to God. But what's our problem? So many times we just take what we think is a little but you can't have two lords. You take a little, you're taking all of it. And you think you give a little to something, but really you've given all of it. Because He set His love upon me. That's not just coming to the altar and saying, all right, Lord, I'm sorry. That's not just coming to a revival meeting and saying, all right, I know that I need to live different. That's saying, Lord, here's everything. 
Not just the basket. Here's it all. I don't know where it came to, well, if I can just get this ironed out, then God will be able to use it. God can use a donkey or a rooster to preach to Balaam and to Peter. Right? God used a whale to preach to Jonah. Well, a whale, big fish. Right? What? It's not about what you can do. It's not about you getting something. You know, I just got to get this sorted out. No, it's just you giving yourself to Him. Moses was a murderer. He didn't say, well, I've got to go settle that debt with Pharaoh first. Right? I mean, as much as God used him, Samson was a womanizer. And even though he wasn't judging God's people like God instructed him to, God would still use him, even though he was down in a certain village visiting some harlots. What was the key to all those people? They gave themselves to God. They weren't always what they should have been, but when God called on them, they gave everything that they had to God. You know when the Queen of Sheba was impressed with Solomon when his all was at the temple. She said, when I saw the way that he went up to the house of God, that's when I knew what made that man a special king. It wasn't his servants, it wasn't his wealth, it wasn't his knowledge. It was that he loved God more than anything and God was just blessing him. And she left and said, I want to be good to the man of God and gave him all that stuff anyway that he wasn't impressed with when she showed it to him. He said, hmm, Gold's nice, spices are nice. But see, I've got a taste of something that this world can't satisfy. That was God. You know when Solomon lost his mind? When he stopped making God the first thing in his life. That's why in his old age he bowed down and worshipped other gods. He took something back and it drove him crazy because he could never find that thing that used to satisfy him. Because he never went back to God and gave his all back to him. Set your love upon God. God will do it whole lot and you'll think well Lord I don't know how all this is going to pan out doesn't matter if I know he's got all my love and he's shown he's not going to let it be abused nothing in this world is ever going to touch anything in God's throne room he says I've got a spot right here for your, I love you so much I've got a spot dedicated for you but in order to claim it in order for him to show me the fullness of my salvation, I've got to commit all of my love. Set it on God. Because you know what? God takes pride. Yeah, one of these days we're going to throw crowns and jewels and gems and all the treasures that he decks us with. We're going to throw it back at his feet. But you know the jewel that means the most to him? The love of someone that says, even though I haven't seen him, never heard his voice, I've never been in the same room with him physically. But at one, I believe what he wrote down. But two, I choose to reject everything that makes sense to me and love the one that said he loved me so much. Yeah, every now and then I get, you know, them Holy Ghost goosebumps. I get to feeling him around. I've never seen him. But because he loved me, I love him. And he sees a jewel. It's something that he delights in. That he delights in his. When does he delight in them? When they just let their love shine as a beacon for how much God means to them. God will put it on. That's something worthy of his son. Because what was the Father's will? That the son be glorified, magnified. One of these days, every knee's going to bow, every tongue's going to confess. But one old song wrote put it this way. Did I mention that I love them? How I worship and adore them? When I can see no way, he makes a way. You know what that songwriter found out? If I set my love on God, he takes care of the rest. I'm not in it for the perks. I'm in it just for him. But because he loves me, I get all that too. And I found out that if I just stay at the Father's house, I can abide under the shadow. Of it. I'll be so close to God that the devil can't get to me without walking in God's shadow. You know why the psalmist said, goodness and mercy are going to follow me? I'm going to be so close to God, even goodness and mercy are going to have to take a back row seat. They're going to have to be behind me because I'm going to be so close to God and following after them that they've got to be out there somewhere. Surely it's going to be around me because I'm just going to be around Him. 
If you enjoyed today's broadcast, head on over to your app store and download the IBC Florence app today, where we have our music, sermons, videos, devotions, and much more. And as always, thanks for listening.